Um, this is a multi-layered process that is that takes a long time to build up a capability. But once you're inside that network, then you are you need actions on. You need to be able to control your penetration. That can be very difficult when a system is changed, when it goes to war, or is unplugged from from uh, other systems because it goes out the gate. Um, but you also need to make sure that your adversary doesn't patch it, and that might not be them finding your penetration. It could simply be the fact that they change their system in a way that means that when you activate your piece of code, it doesn't work as you expected. And so you don't actually control what penetrations you've been placed with much lead time. Um, and unless, it, unless you are very lucky, it's not necessarily going to be available when you want it. Now, there are specific circumstances if you're setting up a very bespoke mission, like targeting uh, the nuclear facilities in Iran, where operating over several years, you can gain access and achieve a strategic effect with a cyber weapon. But when it comes to kind of using conventional force and integrating them, the lead times on cyber weapons are far too long and the opportunity to use it, it doesn't usually line up neatly with when military operations are taking place. And therefore, what you find is that cyber warfare is actually very, very difficult to integrate. It's essentially uh, harassment and attritional rather than a decisive capability that functions as a kind of codependent maneuver capability. Um, and so, you know, that really needs to be challenged as a, as a way that we're going to supposedly fight in the future. Um, but I'll hand over to Justin to summarize the next chapter. Thanks, Jack. Um, and uh, it may be that we're under cyber attack as well. Apologies for any choppiness that uh, future um, are going to be conducted in the grey zone. All that, uh, you know, adversaries like Russia and China have somehow discovered some new devious way of getting at the West by bypassing our conventional strengths because they, they, they it's, it's more efficient somehow for them to operate below the threshold of con armed conflict this is a really dangerous assumption that needs to be challenged because what we see consistently particularly from russia is that actually where there isn't sufficient sufficient conventional deterrence in place the russians are more than happy to use overwhelmed force and indeed many of the the sort of ways and means that are lumped into this kind of hybrid or gray zone discussion are overt uses of military force that you know by any means so by any description if you analyze them rationally are conventional conflicts uh, you know the, the bombardments in ukraine or the use of unbadged troops they are uses of military force to seize territory um furthermore th this sort of um lumping of everything into the gray zone or sort of hybridity um, risks really obscure how different a lot of the strategies being undertaken by, say, China versus strategies being undertaken by Russia actually are. Um, they have often very little to do with each other beyond the fact that most regional actors are conventionally deterred from horizontal military response. Um, and you know, if we sort of all lump this in, uh, a there's a lack of, well, there's a temptation to avoid analyzing what's actually going on and why. Um, but secondly, we risk having a more convenient compete uh, below you know, the level where, where you know, we would have to confront state adversities with serious wars. But then, of course, if you actually drive defense decisions that way to the point that you lose credibility in high-end warfighting, there's nothing for three from escalating beyond where you're capable and bypassing that. Um, in other words, the final kind of line in that chapter would be that the grey zone is defined by the development. Um, that, that capabilities aren't objectively above or below the threshold uh, or this room for, or sort of hybrid military well, because they make it clear that they'll respond very rapidly with military force to the rest of things. Uh, so uh, I'll try and uh, get some better um, <laughs> get some better signal 
Hello, well, we seem to be having a, a few difficulties with Justin's uh, connection there. So uh, whilst he's trying to reestablish that, Jack, can we skip? I might, I might yeah, I will, I will go on to the next chapter and we'll see whether Justin can reconnect. Thank you very um, much. So another challenge that I think we, we wanted to make was this conception that is very prevalent in the UK uh, defence discussion at the moment of doing more with less, uh, or the idea that modern operations mean that you don't need to have mass in the conventional sense. Um, we saw this argument made by CGS at Land Warfare Conference, the idea that modern operations require less mass. Um, now, it is certainly true that there are certain capabilities that do not need, where you can get more effect out of fewer platforms. Um, a modern recce screen supported by highly capable fires can generate more lethality than it used to be able to because the range has increased, the effect of the munitions have increased, and the precision has increased. That makes sense. But firstly, when you dig into most of the examples that people generate to make this argument that you can do more with less, firstly, it fails to reflect the fact that those things are also true of our adversaries. And so if they haven't significantly reduced their size of force, then they can still do relatively more than you. Um, and you have to look at this in a competitive dynamic simply because your system is more effective doesn't mean that you have made a gain against your actual opponent. The second issue is that when you start breaking down tasks, yes, a fire system might be uh, slightly more capable, but that doesn't actually correlate to all of the tasks that you require a military formation to do. And so, for example, if you are operating in a complex urban environment, let's say part of Kabul, and you need to control large crowds that are trying to move through that area, as we saw over the summer, it took the best part of the infantry components of a division to control a single facility. And even then, that was with the collaboration of our erstwhile adversaries in the Taliban. If they had been opposing us, it would have taken considerably more mass than that. Um, and the third issue is that very often the examples that are presented in terms of not needing mass are more about reallocating mass rather than uh, not needing it. So to use the fires example again, you might be withdrawing the density, force density in your, in your forward elements, but you need to increase the fires capability. And if you're not doing that rebalancing, then actually you're not seeing a significant increase in capability. The other thing that's very dangerous about this is that when it's being used to essentially bring units below their, their critical levels of capability, what you find is that they hit a critical point where the capability drops off very suddenly. Um, there is, a, in other words, a minimum critical mass. And below that, you can't sustain the level of readiness. And in many cases in the UK, we are tripping over those lines quite quickly. Um, and then the final issue with mass is that if it becomes an argument to justify having the minimum possible force to generate on paper a, a particular formation, then you don't have any reserve and you have no ability to accept attrition. And the result is that as a commander, preservation of the force becomes a priority in and of itself and you become exceedingly risk averse. And that risk aversion means that it becomes much harder to pursue the high trade off, high reward approach that is demanded in, say, the maneuverist approach. Um, you become much more predictable, much slower, as indeed British commanders in a number of conflicts have done before in order to manage um, their vulnerability when they realise that there isn't a backup option. And so the assumption that you can do more with less is arguably a very dangerous one, and it's one that doesn't reflect what the critical mass is and what the balance is in relation to the adversary. Um, it simply is a, is a discussion that's being used to justify actual reductions in capability and we think that needs to be challenged so with that i don't know whether justin has regained his connection but uh let's see hopefully so um hopefully you can hear me at least um so the uh, uh let's try that so the um subsequent chapter uh is looks at the sort of myth that we see continuously through both you know things as basic as all the powerpoint slides that you constantly see, constantly see in presentations um particularly in the air side of things um of kind of these you know network network enabled 3d printed swarming munitions and kind of attritable cheap uavs that are going to magically basically make the combat mass problem in the air go away um, by providing things that are cheap, attritable, relatively capable, and therefore we can field them in large numbers and they'll, they'll you know, 
uh, slowly augment and then take the place of uh, sunset capabilities like expensive fast jets. Um, it, essentially, the, the point this chapter is making is that physics still applies at its most basic level. And so, A, if you are trying to launch something from a, let's say, uh, a transport aircraft, a lot of concepts look at that. So something like a C-130 or an A-400, that will then have to be launched from outside the threat range against that transport aircraft of the latest systems, which already is pushing 400 kilometers at medium altitudes. So that supposedly cheap swarming capability that you're trying to uh, build will either be very slow and therefore difficult to synchronize with normal jet propelled things or very large and expensive like a cruise missile, so, which means you can't afford enough of them to have them in numbers to swarm the battlefield and certainly not repeatedly. Um, equally, if you want a UAV, uh, either it's going to be a loyal wingman that goes alongside your loyal wingman type uh, concept that goes alongside in tactical terms fast jets, in which case it will have to have comparable range, comparable speed, be a relatively comparable size and therefore weight and therefore cost. Um, and therefore, again, you're not fielding these in, in, in the numbers that uh, you know, often are sort of alluded to, but also you're certainly not fielding them at a cost that means that they're expendable um, in the tr traditional sense, at least not for anyone other than the US and the, Ch the Chinese and they'll struggle too. Um, and particularly there's this sort of word soup. So in the IOPC, there's even a description of sort of, uh, you know, munitions that are coming down from space that are hypersonic and swarming and you know, sort of go, well, there's absolutely no way that things can be space bound hypersonic and swarming it's cheap enough to be swarming it, it's it's a nonsense um and so when when these things are kind of all combined into this word soup there's this promissory narrative that just is undercut by the reality of what you can actually afford at a given price point in terms of range speed performance sensor capabilities etc um so plenty of good stuff in there in terms of you know swarming munitions absolutely give new tactical uh, promise for what single platforms can achieve um, absolutely give new tactical uh, options for overcoming difficult problems. But fundamentally, the West's ultimate problem at the moment in the air is that we can't afford enough munitions to service the number of targets that we need to have a decisive effect. And making those munitions more complicated and capable will make them more expensive. So actually, although your ability to hit individual targets will become more assured, the likelihood is that without a lot more expenditure, the core problem of not having enough will get worse. Um, and uh, with that, I'll hand over to Jack Pern. Um, so the next issue that we wanted to confront is, is sort of the taboo around casualties and casualty aversion. Um, there is often this narrative that springs to mind, and, and this is one of those things reflected in the cyber attack sort of myth, that a single high profile attack will deter countries from doing things. Um, you know, you just have to inflict a, a single mass casualty incident and national will will crumble. Um, and certainly when we're looking at the operate space in the UK, i.e. non-war fighting, there is a, an assumption that people are hugely casualty averse. Casualty aversion, the idea that, you know, we can't take casualties, um, we can't risk casualties because the public won't stand for it, is a self-fulfilling sort of risk constraint around defense that means that a lot of options are turned off before they're even presented to ministers, let alone properly worked out. But the reality is that when you look at the historical record, firstly, when countries do take mass casualties, it often canalizes a response in the population, which is to unify and to strengthen their resolve, not to walk away. They are not usually deterred by mass casualty incidents, especially if those incidents involve civilians as a cyber attack would against critical national infrastructure like the NHS. Um, it actually makes people more aggressive. Um, where they become less casualty tolerant is when they see lives being wasted or a bad strategy. And so the fundamental underlying point here is that firstly, countries can take a lot of punishment before they, they are no longer viable. And the idea of a single knockout blow by any means is, is a bad assumption. Um, but the second point is that actually the key thing is not, not to have any casualties, it's to explain to people why you are risking them to make the case. And in, in the British military at the moment, there is simultaneously a desire to do things quietly to avoid having to make that case because the experience from Iraq and Afghanistan means that there is a reluctance to justify things. Um, but as a result, it means that defense activity is often conducted at such a low level or with such little tolerance for going outside the wire that it's very unlikely to achieve a significant effect. 
um, so that it becomes a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy of, of we can't do things and we're not achieving things. Um, if you are going to achieve things, you need to put significant mass into the theatre, which exposes you to risk and you need to take risks. And in order to do that, you need to positively make the case to the public. And the evidence historically is quite clear that if the public buys your evidence and your line, which they often do, then actually risk tolerance is very high and casualty tolerance is very high. It's worth noting that um, I, I haven't tracked the number today, but a few months ago, we had 138,000 dead from COVID-19 and government approval ratings moved by about two points over that period. Um, so the notion that there is a, you know, a point at which public support will collapse purely because of casualties is a, a item of faith that is not backed up by the evidence and it is seriously hampering the ability of the Ministry of Defence to generate and put forward options in military domain. Um, so with that, I will hand back over to Justin, unless we've lost him once again. Um, in which case, because I think he is reconnecting. I think yeah, um, we have lost him. So could you go? We have lost him. Next? Very good. In which case, I will jump to my next chapter and we'll see whether he, he can jump Thank back you. in. Um, so the final one that I want to get after is, is this notion of any sensor, any shooter networks. Um, it's a very, very prevalent concept in defense at the moment. The US is pursuing it through joint all domain command and control. And the first thing I want to highlight is that, yes, it is a useful capability to make systems uh, compatible with one another. And there are circumstances where it is highly useful. For example, uh, cooperative engagement frameworks in the US Navy that allow a task group to prioritize incoming targets, and allocate point defense efficiency efficiently across those targets is viable, can be done now, is very useful. And you can imagine those frameworks being used in other places as well. So this isn't an argument against uh, joining things up. However, there are really serious constraints in terms of what you can get out of that. And some of the visions of sort of perfect situational awareness that are briefed time and time again in relation to the digital backbone are highly misleading. They're misleading firstly because you get a different effect in each domain. In the air domain and in the maritime environment, you have much greater access to power generation through jet engines and, and motors on your, on your vessels. And you also often have line of sight because of the elevation of your assets. Um, and that allows you to transmit at very high bandwidth, which is not replicable on land. And so a joint network between land and air is automatically going to be very difficult because you're moving quite different bandwidths of data. But even if we look at something like the F-35, that generates more data, modern sensors do this, than you can possibly th fit through the available bandwidth. And so the question is not accumulating all of that data, but rather how do you get the relevant data? And the further issue here is that the crew of these platforms, whether it be land platforms with sensors or, or air platforms, are often so saturated in information that even they, and with the support of edge processing, will struggle to make judgments about what to send back without a lot of help from the system. And so the critical question becomes not, uh, can I accumulate everything, but rather, or any sensor to any shooter, but rather, what information is the highest priority on the network? Because as soon as you force that through the network, it will close off access to other streams of data. And so your choice is actually to access some shooters some of the time. And while that might give you incremental advantage in some places, it's not going to be as transformative as people think, um, especially if you simply don't have the mass to service a lot of the, the targets that you're finding. Um, and so that's one issue. The other issue is that often, you know, information uh, and military operations are generated through tempos that are not actually fixed to the information environment. Um, generating sorties from aircraft carriers, for example, is not going to be retasked on the fly because of information received from off-board sensors. There's a fairly fixed tempo to operations and planning and enablement that has to line up perfectly to make those sorts of operations and aerial refueling work. And so the ability to change the formula on the fly is a lot more limited in most circumstances than a lot of the concepts that are being discussed allows for. The critical question we need to have is not so much uh, the idea of accumulating all of our data, but rather having a much better grip on what data matters to whom. Because until we have that priority stack understood, then we are essentially saturating the capacity of the network to enact our vision. Um, Justin, I jumped over you, so I don't know whether you want to go back to, to the issue of issues of space. 
um, but I'll hand over. Yes, apologies. I think this is probably because we, uh, we're criticizing the effectiveness of cyber that our Wi-Fi is it's playing up. Um, yeah, it, it, essentially on the space chapter, um, the argument is, is basically that the narratives around the militarization of space and the uh, position of space in future warfare um, are oversimplified in terms of both an overemphasis on the immediate risk and likelihood of direct kinetic ASAP type conflict in space um, as the sort of one of the, the you know, you often hear it say, day one we'll lose space in a major war and you know, there needs to be much more resilience in space because space assets will be attacked and all the rest of it. Um, the, the essential argument is that A, space is so difficult to firewall um, between the commercial, uh, the multinational and the defense space, so that it's very difficult for kinetic conflict in space to be contained in the way that you know, even uh, most modern flashpoint types between major powers in much the way of the Korea chip, but are likely to be relatively fined, uh, at least initially, in terms of trying to prevent them spreading because neither side is likely to have an incentive to see them spread more widely. And therefore, a, an early use of kinetics in space is likely to have so many uh, unknown risk factors and escalation implications beyond the initial confines of that flashpoint that it's relatively unlikely to occur. And it's quite a useful way of also conceiving of potential limitations on wider strategies like the US MDI, um, or sorry, MBDO, um, where you know, if your strategy relies on rapidly going, for example, left of launch into other people's territory, um, that sort of tends to ignore the fact that politics will typically constrain uh, a lot of what you can actually do, even in a high intensity conflict in the early stages, because the incentives will generally be at least for one side or the other uh, to keep it uh, geographically and politically confined as long as possible. Um, also worth remembering, just to finish off on the gray zone stuff, um, which apologies for the cutoff earlier, um, that the, the the sort of fundamental point on, on the gray zone or threshold uh, conflict, sort of threshold of armed conflict, is that it's defined by the defender. Um, so, you know, things that the Russians might do with little green men, let's say, to take Ukraine as an example, they weren't uh, not met with horizontal force because they were somehow inherently hybrid activities. They were conventional military escalation with an implausible, deniable off-ramp uh, for Ukrainian and Western politicians to accept that they were conventionally overmatched. In scenarios where you have conventional overmatch and the ability to counter-escalate, there is a massively less room for an opponent to uh, attack you successfully in the gray zone. Um, and B, uh, it's worth remembering that things that we think of are you know, inherently tools of competition or, or sub-threshold tools are not necessarily that way simply because we might view them as sub-threshold when done to us. That sub-threshold discussion has to be had in terms of what the opponent will see those actions at and how they feel empowered to escalate or not, particularly with use of, of uh, conventional military forces. So too much of a focus on uh, sub-threshold tools, it, we feel ignores the fundamental realities of deterrence uh, and the, the sort of relationship between sub-threshold activity and the conventional balance of forces. And I think just um, because we had the, the connection issues earlier, I might just add to that very briefly. And, and Justin did explain this, but in case it was as broken up for you as it was for me. Um, the, the real issue with the gray zone is that what we are seeing here is everything that isn't high intensity war fighting essentially being thrown in a conceptual dustbin, which means that, you know, these things are all lumped together and treated as though they are one concept sub threshold gray zone activity, when actually they are a very wide range of different tools being used by states to pursue very different strategies. And if we don't examine these strategies in terms of the ends being sought, then some of them might be quite escalatory and we will miss it, as with Ukraine, um, and some of them may be de-escalatory. Some of them may be a reaction to our actions, and we fail to comprehend that because we treat them as comparable when they're fundamentally not. So, for example, just to, to use two, two points that have both sort of been thrown into this, into this dustbin, um, China harassing Taiwan is a very good example of them trying to 
essentially progressively gain access to Taiwan's airspace by pricing them out of being able to counter the number of sorties generated against them, just making it financially really difficult for them to meet that threat. And then because their threat is not met, going further and further over time. So it's essentially a certain dominance over the airspace. Um, whereas Iran's response to, in terms of mining and, and uh, attacks in Saudi Arabia, were, was not really them escalating. It was them responding to the maximum pressure strategy, which was overtly described as a campaign trying to bring about regime change. Um, that is an inherently escalatory thing to do, irrespective of whether you are using military tools or other tools. Um, the fact that the Iranians chose to respond using some military capabilities doesn't mean that uh, you know, they are escalating from the gray zone into the military sphere. Um, they, are, they are responding to quite an aggressive strategy with a counter strategy to try and force negotiation. Um, and unless you understand state behavior in the terms of the ends being sought, then you end up essentially coming up with inappropriate responses. Um, so that's a kind of overview of the, of the various chapters. But I think um, given that they are fairly direct challenges to a lot of what is going around in defense at the moment, there will be plenty of questions. So I will, I will surrender the floor to Paul to, um, to moderate those. Thank you both very much for that. And as you say, that was uh, quite a, a forthright uh, set of views on uh, much of the, de the defense policy. Um, just a reminder to everybody, if you do wish to ask a question, then please put it in the Q&A section uh, on the screen in front of you, and I'll do my best to go through those. Um, so th the first uh, question, if I may, is from, from Sam Jardine. He says, very interesting set of points about mass and platforms, particularly in terms of grey zone warfare. Uh, I think, Justin, he may have had the same kind of challenge that you had with the, the internet as well. Um, but he, he mentions in terms of grey zone competition and horizontal escalation, uh, the UK is seemingly on a trajectory to commit more to new strategic frontiers like the Indo-Pacific, the High North, for example, and supporting partners in the face of increasing Russian and Chinese operations. So his question is, does the UK need to relook at its physical presence and invest in cheaper fly the flag presence assets like the black swan corvette that was rumored a, a number of years ago or is that what you can envisage the role for the new rangers to be thank you um so I, i'm happy to take a first stab at that uh, assuming i don't break up and get cut off uh but what i'd say is the i think there's there's plenty to be said for uh assets which are designed specifically for presence signaling, sort of basically the compete space uh, well away from high-end warfighting. Um, indeed, one could, if one were being, uh, trying to be controversial, make, this, make the, the assertion that a lot of the Royal Navy's surface fleet is already configured in that way. Um, but I think that the key thing is to be clear about, uh, clear-eyed about which bits of your force are intended to be credible in warfighting terms and which bits are not. Um, because there's a, it's, it's a very good way to waste a huge amount of money, but also to potentially insert buyouts that are not, not perhaps justified um, in terms of cross-force uh, reliance assumptions um, by adding just a little bit of warfighting focus capability to certain platforms or certain programs, when in reality, the whole doesn't really add up to that. Um, so, for example, you might take an approach where you say, right, well, the Royal Navy, you know, has uh, is to be given outfitted with surface ships, which are primarily intended for presence, phone ops, signaling, buying out American capability, for example, in the Eastern Med or the Gulf, where uh, you know, in the case that the Americans need to take a carrier group out quickly to go and do something very serious in the Pacific. Uh, and in the meantime, air and, and uh, you know, the core of one or three div are to be you know, optimized for warfighting in Europe. You might, you, you could see a delineation there, um, even at that kind of macro service level. I think the key is just to be clear about which space each set of capabilities is meant to play in and what your real capabilities are and, and not sort of assume that because you're well set up to, set, to sort of play in the compete space, if you have no capability to deter escalation conventionally, that uh, you know, adversary forces will allow you to compete in that space where you're optimized for if this may be out of your, your freedom of action. Thank you, Justin. And you finished that just before I think the sound uh, uh, distorted you uh, beyond recognition for a moment. Um, Jack, before you come to that, that particular question, 
about the, uh, the, the multiple presence of, uh, of the limited mass and whether we need to invest also in, uh, in more points of presence, cheaper platforms. Uh, Bled and Bowen poses a related question uh, here, which is about the how does the British Army readiness levels help it cope with numerous demands made on it by UK government over the last 24 months? going from crisis to crisis at home, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as overseas, and assuming no dramatic turnaround in spending or personnel numbers, should the British Army be reformed as a gendarmerie service or centralised domestic emergency response arm? Um, I, no, it absolutely shouldn't be turned into that. Um, the use of the British Army has, is in an expeditionary capacity, and it's very important in terms of our alliance structures, our trading relationships and our security, that it is able to do that uh, expeditionary function. There isn't a massive territorial threat to the United Kingdom itself, and therefore the utility of spending lots of money on a homebound force is highly questionable. And in terms of um, the willingness of the armed forces when instructed to make up for failings of other government departments. Yes, it will do that because it's a crisis response tool and, and soldiers will do as they are ordered. Um, but we shouldn't guess it, you know, we shouldn't avoid the fact that if we're using the military for providing basic civilian services, then things have gone very badly wrong elsewhere. Um, and it shouldn't be the assumption that the military are being used to re-establish power because companies that are paid to provide power to people are not doing that, or that the military are going around and you know, having to check on people in, in adverse weather um, because the emergency services are not appropriately equipped or they're in enough numbers to do that. Um, you know, those are tasks for which the military can step in, but it shouldn't be the Ministry of Defence's responsibility to um, obviate the need for those capabilities in other departments of state. Um, in terms of the point about cheaper platforms and presence, I think, I think there is just a basic point about uh, levels of ambition versus amounts of resourcing and how realistic it is, right? So if we take the future commando force, it's a good concept uh, in my view, and, and there's a lot of very good work being done in terms of tactics development. Um, but if you look at the mass within that formation, they generate four strike companies, which are being split into two theatres. Um, and so that constitutes, you know, 200 people as the leading edge of that capability spread across two theatres. You really have to ask what effect you think that is going to have. Um, I would suggest much less than what is being sold. Um, and if the concept is worthwhile and it's good, then it needs to be resourced pro properly. You need to hit that point of critical mass where it is a capability that makes a difference. Um, if you try and bleed your resources everywhere, if you try and go into lots of new theatres, but you're not going to resource those lines of effort, then you can't expect to have a significant effect. And as Justin says, adversaries will very easily increase the level of risk for you to operate there and price you out of being able to do anything serious anyway, um, because you won't have the capability to hand to be able to escalate against them. Um, so, you know, I think there's a, there is a need to be honest about the level of stretch you can maintain with the resources available and then to prioritize. And if the integrated review was very good, I thought in articulating all of these different interests, but it didn't articulate a clear hierarchy of priorities. Thank you. If we could turn our attention now, maybe to the question about risk and public support and the casualty areas, uh, because there are a number of questions that have cropped up there. Uh, and one comment, which I, I think I owe Mary Dijewski the, the, uh, the right of reading, and it says, uh, I seriously question whether seeing COVID deaths in the same light as war casualties is, is fair. My view is that people saw COVID deaths, at least pre-vaccination, more like an act of God. That's not how war casualties are seen, at least not in the industrialised world today. Uh, but I'll leave that because I think you can come back to that in, in responding to Julian Brazer's question, which is uh, that you make some powerful points about risk and public support, but in his view, the problem goes deeper than, than is suggested. It's not just that people lost confidence in the direction of operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, many are now questioning the whole purpose of defense and justifying budgets in the face of competing social programs gets harder all the time. Do you accept that seeing the armed forces engaged in areas where the public can see and understand, whether that's anti-terror or protecting against cyber attacks, 
uh, is critical for sustaining support for defence spending. Over. Well, I mean, to, to take that issue by the horns, um, in Iraq and well, in Afghanistan, at least, um, the public became increasingly sceptical that the military were achieving anything. And the results of what happened to the partner force when any, you know, when the support was withdrawn speaks for itself in terms of what was actually being achieved. And, you know, we were told by military officers repeatedly that this is the season where it will change. You know, now is the turning point, a bit more longer, a bit more resource, everything's getting better. Uh, and it clearly wasn't. And so, you know, the public actually saw much earlier than many of those who were briefing that the strategy wasn't working. Um, and their judgment was fairly sound, I think, on that. Um, so, you know, I think, can you sustain support? Well, actually, if you make the case and you have a good case, yes. If you can't make that case, then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, in terms of highlighting the, you know, the distinction between COVID deaths and, and military deaths, yes, they are different. Um, but I'm not saying that they are the same, but um, military deaths are very often something that is done to you by an outside force, an enemy in the case of war. Um, COVID obviously is not an enemy, it's a, it's a natural um, disease, but nonetheless, it is imposed upon you. And the way that countries react to that very much depends on the competence that they see within the government. Um, and it depends upon, you know, how they feel their behavior will shape their community or their likelihood of success. And so what I would say is the Ministry of Defense need to be, needs to be much bolder, much clearer in articulating the point of what it is doing and to make that case. And what it tends to do is retreat and close down. Um, I remember when I was a journalist, and you would try and get comment from, from defense on, on anything, really. Um, and the response was essentially to go into a defensive crouch the whole time and not to justify anything unless they had to. Um, the services are usually quite forward-leaning and engaging with the press, but defense as a whole really, really was reluctant to engage or to justify itself. Um, and if you do that, then funnily enough, people get very skeptical of you and you end up with quite a hostile relationship, which is what I would say the Ministry of Defence has with a lot of journalists. So um, I think, you know, that there is a cultural shift that needs to happen in the willingness to make the case. Um, and if you are prepared to make the case, then I think a lot of the assumptions about casualty aversion are misplaced and not supported by the historical evidence. Thank you, Jack. But just to, to pick up on the, the broader point in the context of defence spending, and uh, Julian's comment was about uh, the ability to justify the, the amount of money that goes into defence, and of course this government has increased that, that money, uh, but his point I think was it's becoming increasingly difficult to, to justify that to, to the public. Do you have any views on, on that and what that might what, be? What I would say is that if you, if you ask the public whether more should be spent on defence and whether certain capabilities should be purchased, then the answer is always yes, right? Like polls come back with a resounding support for spending more on defence. When you ask them whether more should be spent on defence as opposed to being spent on hospitals or schools or whatever else it might be, that's when you get into the rather nuanced and difficult trade-offs and, and public opinion is much less supportive. Um, and so making a clearer argument about the utility seems like a starting point and being a bit more direct about the threat and why certain capabilities are needed. But if you're gonna do that, you also need to highlight where we have underspent and therefore be slightly less defensive and more prepared to have a public and open conversation about the extent to which a lack of investment has led to a degradation in capability. If you're not prepared to level with people about that, if your messaging is always very positive and saying everything's great, look at our very, very old vehicles in our vehicle, but we're gonna, you know, on, on, that we're driving around, but we're gonna pretend that they're world beating and use that language, which we often do, then you can't be surprised when people say, but if it's world beating, then, um, then why do you need new ones? Um, when we know in defense that those vehicles are very old and not world beating and need to be upgraded. So, so I think there is an honesty issue there around communication, which leads to defense undermining its own case, but the public is open to hearing the case. Yeah, and just, just to support that, I mean, the, 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 an example that I'd commend right now is the, uh, the fact that you're, you have the buildup of Russian forces to the degree that we do uh, on the Ukrainian border and, you know, multiple Eastern European NATO members expressing serious alarm. Um, I think part of the reason why the government is, and the defence as a whole is perhaps 
less inclined to talk about that. Um, you know, frankly, it should be a major talking point for defence. This is this is a potentially very very serious uh, shift and degradation of the European security architecture, which unavoidably affects us. Is because the immediate follow on question will be, well, what can we do about it? Um, and even if it's not something directly, how well placed would we be for X or Y contingency? And I think they're worried about the answer. So, you know, just to reinforce Jack's point, I think there's a very, very easy route to making the public a lot more willing to hear the message. But it does involve honesty about our current state of affairs in terms of broadly speaking capability um, and therefore the need for serious investment to uh, remedy things. Thank you, Justin. That brings us very nicely to Christopher Samuel's question, which is, are the media muddying the understanding and knowledge of the public in this regard? Um, I, I don't think that the media are, are muddying understanding. I think defence journalists have a very, very difficult time because on the one hand, you have a public that doesn't really interact with the military and is not very familiar with the military. And you have a military that talks almost exclusively in acronyms and jargon. Um, which no copy editor in their right mind would put into print. And so as a journalist, you are forced to turn endless reams of jargon-filled sort of screens into something that's comprehensible to your readers. And it's very hard to do and very hard to defend with your editor. Um, and the fact that defence doesn't lean in more to help them with that, but is instead, as I say, very adversarial in the way that it deals with, with journalists, means that um, you end up with mutual confusion um, and you end up with a lot of headlines and, and stories going out that are less than clear. Um, but I think that's that's partly a reflection of the fact that actually defence doesn't engage very positively with the press. Thank you. Um, could I move us to space now, uh, please? Uh, so there is a, a question from Tim Dowes, who says, is there reason to be concerned that Western militaries would be more hampered in a conflict by the loss of space-based capabilities than would potential adversaries like China and Russia? Um, so I think the, there, there, it's, it's unavoidably true that uh, China or Russia would suffer less in military terms um, than the United States uh, or its allies. Uh, from a loss of access to space-based capabilities. Um, on the other hand, A, a lot of the most critical American capabilities are in uh, geosynchronous orbit, um, or indeed, or at least higher up than LEO. And A, then so for a start, the number of uh, kinetic capabilities that can reach them is, is more limited. Um, but also, uh, you know, fundamentally, any serious attack on the viability of the space domain that could risk uh, you know, a debris cascade, for example, it, even if it's not militarily crippling for Russia or China, it would be economically crippling to both. So, uh, and indeed potentially socially crippling. So, I, I just don't see the the. the, the I, I see potential for miscalculation, but the majority of the the sort of competition I think we're we're likely to see short of an all out unrestricted war between states, um, is already going on. With you know non-kinetic disruption and attacks on satellites in terms of you know dazzling potentially rendezvous and proximity operations uh, or at least the capability to do so um you know hack, hacking attacks or, or even physical um you know penetration on ground stations um attacks on the networks that distribute the information um all of those sort of things are already happening and i think are likely to continue but the 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 fear of an immediate kinetic attack on capabilities in low orbit um, on the first day of a, of a sort of flashpoint conflict, I think is overblown uh, and misses the point about the, the or risks drowning the, the, the key point about the vulnerability of um, soft denial of orbital capabilities in a given AO, um, which is more likely to be the kind of main issue. Thank you. We have about eight minutes left and there are still quite a lot of questions to, to get through. So I'm going to try and group a couple together. Uh, the first one is from uh, John Walker, and he's talking about war stocks for precision, for precision strike. I'll put my teeth in the moment. Uh, he says, if I interpreted your comments correctly, I think you're advocating the need to have enough rounds to enable us to break adversary will. Do your misgivings about mass of high tech munitions hold if our aim is to target key critical national infrastructure or command and control nodes in order to reduce enemy freedom of maneuver rather than break national will? Perhaps for you, Jack, I think 
Yeah, sure. So I, I think one of the one of the big problems that I have is that um, people talk about effects in the deep uh, making an anticlimactic close fight, i.e., that you know if you're if you're going to smash key control nodes and infrastructure and SAM sites and stuff that's that's in the deep, then all of a sudden you can just sort of waltz in in the close. Um, and I don't think that that's very supportable by the evidence. I think what you find is that long range precision fires of which you will only ever have a limited number for the reasons that Justin highlighted in terms of the cost of those complex munitions um, will dislocate the enemy. They will prevent the enemy from being able to coordinate their own forces. They will uh, break down the enemy's ability to protect their ground maneuver elements with fires. They will uh, reduce the enemy's capacity to reinforce because bridges are knocked down and that kind of thing. Um, and so they will certainly isolate parts of the enemy force, but the enemy force is still there. Um, and you can't saturation bomb with precision munitions because it's just prohibitively expensive in most cases. And so, you know, then you're, and those units are quite survivable if they're dug in. And so you end up having to, to clear out those units. Now, the effects in the deep enable victory in the close because they allow you to break up those enemy components in detail rather than having to fight the enemy system as a whole. And so the task is easier, but it is still going to be a pretty hard fight and it is still going to require a lot of close combat. Um, just consider the war against Daesh, right? 90,000 troops surrounded Mosul, two brigades on rotation were fighting close quarters battle through that city for months. They pretty much leveled block by block with precision munitions. Now, if you look at the correlation of forces, Islamic State did not have very many people, but it still took months. The Some of the most capable urban and close quarters battle trained personnel in the world, the Iraqi counterterrorism service, like they have been doing it at high intensity for years. They are very good at it. Took 40% casualties and all 13 of their battalion commanders were killed going through that. So if the whole of the US and NATO's air power against a non-state actor with no air defenses, with all the precision munitions available, was only able to shape the close sufficiently to allow that to happen, then the idea of an anticlimactic close fight is deeply naive. The other point I'd add to that um, is in terms of uh, looking for strategic effects in terms of shaping an adversary's will uh, with long range precision strike capabilities, I think it, that there is a huge amount to be said for the ability to hit key nodes in terms of particularly air defense networks purely because so much firepower is reliant in the air um, for, for the West and therefore establishing the ability to pulse corridors of or, or temporary sort of pulses of, of access to conduct key strikes or preparatory strikes um, for ground maneuver forces is key. But in terms of strategic effects through fires alone, if you take Russia as the easy example, because it's the biggest problem um, in the European context, I would challenge people to find uh, even 40 targets, 50 targets that you could hit that would cause sufficient damage to break the capability to fight or the will to fight of Russia, which were also not so escalatory as to almost certainly lead to nuclear exchange or at least an unacceptably high threat of nuclear exchange. Um, so th there is that trade-off again, coming back to that, this, this point that conflicts between major powers in the next decade or two are likely to occur, but they're likely to occur in flashpoint scenarios, probably as a result of miscalculation. And then both sides will have a very strong incentive to keep that conflict geographically and ideally politically limited, um, even if it's quite high intensity in the AO itself. And that yeah, the almost, Korean War being a good example. Exactly. Uh, and that, that almost, by its nature, reduces or, or at least limits the effect that you're going to be able to have um, through large scale use of long range precision strike against strategic targets in your enemy's homeland, um, because that's just broadening the war in a way that um, is unlikely to be politically acceptable. Thank you. Um, we're running out of time. We've got about three minutes and I've got three, I think, quite important questions I, I want to pose to you. So, so I will pose all three, uh, if I may. So firstly, you and Grant and Aditi Gupta ask questions about if there isn't much knowledge outside of the closed community of defence, security and intelligence about grey zone, 
then how do we communicate more effectively with the public? And Aditi's question particularly is how do we engage with effective oversight through Parliament on this? The second question to pose is, is one about the heresies themselves. Uh, Matt Ford questions whether the ability of nuclear deterrence to prevent a slide into conventional war is indeed a heresy or not in your view. And if you could tackle just one heresy, this is from Nick English, what would it be? And my final question from Caroline Greenslade is, we've been very critical here, but what components of the integrated operating concept do we actually believe in? So, so uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'll just take the last one first, because I think it's a really good question. You know, there's a lot of really sensible, clever people at defense, and there are a lot of very good concepts out there. And the core thinking in the integrated operating concept that you have you know, protect, engage, constrain, war fight, and that there are, there's a sliding scale and that you're trying to manage escalation within that is all quite sound. And I personally find it quite compelling. Um, the problem that we have is that then you have, right, how do we operationalize that? And what we see is a lot of people grasping novel technology um, in particular as a way of obviating the need for things that they either can't afford or don't want to admit that they need. Um, and conceptually, we also see this. So the IOPSI outlines those four phases and war fighting is a critical part of that continuum. But a lot of the narrative is we're going to optimize in the gray zone. We're never really going to have a war. We're going to, you know, essentially we like operating in the constrained space. It's something that we actually have the capabilities to do. And so most activity will be in the constrained space because we will it to be so. And the reality is, of course, any enemy that can escalate against you, if you are not able to match that escalation, will then shift the back goalposts and escalate in a way that means that you're no longer comfortable. And then you have to make some very, very difficult decisions. So the, the problem I have is, is not so much the core concept, which I think is very sound, um, but it's, it's the essentially uh, the self-deception that accompanies it in terms of a lot of the transformative technologies that people believe are going to mean that this is easy or cheap. Um, Justin, I don't know whether you have anything you want to add to that. Um, otherwise, I will jump on to the next question. Um, I mean, I'll, I was going to say, Justin, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll initially take a, take a run on. Sorry. Yep. Okay. If you're quick, please, because we, we're running out of time. Thank you. Yep. So I'll, I'll just take a take a, a quick run at the other two um, in terms of how do you do oversight? I think the biggest thing would be um, if you're doing oversight uh, and there are things that sound too good to be true or things that sound really a bit too convenient in terms of bang for buck or, or suddenly imagine you know, any sort of silver bullet type solution to a problem. Um, really drill in. And if what comes back sounds like jargon or word soup, then dig in and find some experts and see whether it actually stacks up. Um, because generally speaking, A, a lot of senior decision makers hold much more nuanced views in private than they do uh, when they sign up to public documents or read out speeches that their MAs have prepared. Um, and you know, a lot of them know that there's limitations on this stuff. And so you know, particularly when you hear multiple, anything that sounds like multiple buzzwords being combined, you know, the biggest one being hypersonic, um, so many of these things and this goes to any heresy you know and pick one heresy um just try and drill down onto it because generally speaking if people are cramming together lots of different concepts in one sentence with single words it's probably because there's a lot of nuance that's going unsaid and being missed um if i could pick one heresy it would be the gray zone stuff um so much stuff that i hear attributed to gray zone has nothing to do with gray zone it's just uh, that we've chosen because it's we, we're conventionally deterred to ignore overt conventional aggression, and we're de you know defining it as sub threshold because it's convenient to do so. Um, so you know, the grey zone stuff would be my personal heresy of the of, of choice. Thank you, and, and, and on, on nukes, I'll get back to you, Matt. But but essentially, I think yes, the idea that nukes deter all conflict is 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 wrong. Um, but I would say that the risk of nuclear exchange and therefore the likelihood that everyone loses means that what we are likely to see is limited wars. Um, and that, that can be very high intensity and quite bloody. Um, and I would use uh, the Korean War as a good example of a war where nuclear use was considered and was walked away from, but that didn't stop it being a pretty horrendous affair. 
Jack, thank you. In one sentence, then, which would be your top heresy? I, I would agree with Justin. I think the grey zone, in terms of the ones that we outlined in the book, is the one that's the most important. The, the importance of conventional deterrence in allowing you to, as, a, as an actor, shape what the boundaries of the grey zone actually are. Thank you. Thank you all. Apologies for overrunning by two minutes. And for those of you whose questions we didn't get to, but this has been a really stimulating conversation. Thank you for pressing through, Justin, on the technical issues, but to you and all of your authors uh, for a really insightful publication that I think whether people agree with you or not, uh, it forces us to consider the future of UK defence and confirms the thought process that's so essential as the conceptual component of fighting power. So thank you all of you for joining us who are guests. Thank you, Jack, Justin, and all of the authors for that. And I believe the publication should be available via the RUCI website. Uh, for those soon, of you who soon are, from Amazon as well. Soon from Amazon as well, ready for Christmas. So thank you all very much. And uh, I wish you all a very...